God's word. And um, as Jason said, we're in Ephesians chapter four. And we are reading from verse seven down to verse 16. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to a coach of the son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jackson. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, uh, Pastor JD is out of town this morning, so I get the privilege of being up here and preaching to you all. Uh, let me start off with a word of prayer. God, we uh, thank you for today. We thank you that we're able to gather this morning to uh, read from your word, to understand your word better. And I pray that you will help me to be able to preach clearly uh, what your word says and to be able to uh, help our church just grow together as we look towards you who is our head. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. So I was trying to figure out the name of this the other day and I finally found it. Do you guys know what a photo stand-in is? It's one of those boards, right? You got this big board and there's a hole in it. Usually there's some sort of picture that's painted on there. It's usually like a bodybuilder or a clown or something like that, right? And there's a hole. So you put your head through and you take a picture. Right. And usually it's funny because there's a mismatch between the body and the head. For example, me on a muscular body is kind of funny. Why are you laughing, Alex? <laughs> One of the most unfortunate things about the Christian church at large is that its head, King Jesus, often has a mismatched body. The church is supposed to be the body of Christ, but oftentimes what people see is a body that doesn't match the head that it proclaims. See, the church has not done a very good job using the means that God has supplied it to mature itself. The church looks like a little baby when its head is that of the exalted and glorified King Jesus who rules the universe. And this makes a mockery of Jesus. Church, the world laughs. It looks at our hypocrisy and it condemns our failures as if Jesus has failed. It laughs at Jesus because of his mismatched body. Our passage this morning, in our passage this morning, Paul presents a Jesus that is no laughingstock. He is the king who has granted to the church what it needs to build itself up. Here's our main point this morning. Our main point is this. King Jesus gives to the church what it needs to build itself up to maturity in love. King Jesus gives to the church what it needs to build itself up to maturity in love. Look with me at verse 7. The first word of verse 7 in most English Bible translations is but or however. But or however are conjunctions called a contrastive. They indicate a contrast between one idea and another idea. In this particular instance, Paul is contrasting verse 7 from the verses right above it. So look there with me real quick, starting in verse 4. Starting in verse 4, Paul says this, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all 
and in all. You'll notice the repeat of the word one over and over in those three verses. Part of what Paul is em emphasizing is that we are to understand and live out unity in church. There is a bond between Christians because of Jesus. It results in one body, one unified whole. The context of our passage this morning then is Paul's call for Christians to walk out the gospel in unity, in oneness. Yet, this unity does not mean sameness. Our contrastive this, uh, in verse 7 points out this, uh, this idea, right? He says, we have all this in common. We have all this oneness, but each of us was given different gifts in different measures. There's a diversity of gifts from Jesus, and he gifts us, to, it gives that to us to different extents. What follows from verses 8 to 16 then explains what this means for us to be diverse and yet unified. It explains to us what the gifts that Christ has given to us are and how that then plays out in our local body to promote growth. What I want to do this morning is to show us three points that emerge for us from the text. The first is that we, we see from verses 8 to 10 that Jesus is the exalted king. He is the one who has ascended on high and he rules and reigns from his place of power. The second point is that for, uh, it is from his place of exaltation that Jesus then gifts gifts to the church. And specifically, Paul highlights the gift of those who proclaim God's word. Lastly, we'll see that it is through his gift that those who proclaim God's word, all Christians are then called to work and build up the body. So let's start with our first point. Point number one, Jesus is the ascendant king. Jesus is the ascendant king. Look with me again at verses 8 through 10. Paul states this. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things." To defend his argument that Jesus has given gifts to the church, Paul turns and quotes from Psalm 68, 18. In the Psalm, David writes about the past faithfulness of Yahweh conquering his enemies. This ensures for David the future hope that God is going to defeat his enemies for good. The climax of Psalm 68 is verses 17 and 18. And in those verses, it is Yahweh who moves from Mount Sinai to Mount Zion, right? He moves from where he gave the law at Sinai and he goes to Zion in the city of David. He moves from where he gave the law to the place where he rules. The imagery that is used there is God ascending to Zion where he inhabits and rules, Zion, the city of David, the capital of Israel, is the throne room of God. It is from there that David envisions God as king, and he will bring salvation to his people, where he crushes his enemy, where he gives in abundance, where he brings salvation, and where all the nation comes and worships God. Paul picks up this ascension imagery and he finds its fulfillment in Jesus. It is Jesus who has ascended, not just to Mount Zion, but to where Paul says far above all the heavens. It is Jesus who sits enthroned over the entire cosmos. It is there that he brings about salvation for his people, where he crushes the head of the enemy, where he gives in abundance to his people, and where all the nations are called to worship Jesus as Lord and God. Paul sees at Jesus as the fulfillment of Psalm 68, 18. It is because Jesus rules and reigns that he gives gifts to his people because he's accomplished the purpose of establishing his kingdom. Look at verses 9 and 10 in your Bibles again with me. It's interesting that Paul notes Jesus' descent twice. Why emphasize Jesus' descent if the point is that he's ascended? What's Paul getting at and highlighting that the one who ascended is the one who descended? Why is that important? The logic seems a little bit mundane. It seems like Paul is stating Jesus couldn't go up if he hadn't gone down. But what I believe Paul is saying 
is that he would not, Jesus would not have accomplished what he needed to accomplish if he had not gone down. There was something that was accomplished in his going down that made his going up different than if he had never done it at all. What did Jesus do in coming down? Jesus came down and became a man. God the Son took upon himself human flesh specifically to fulfill God's law and die on our behalf. The purpose of his descent was a substitutionary purpose. He had to descend to become a man for man. He had to die. God raised him up and seated him far above the heavens so that as a man, he fulfilled everything that man needed to do. We see this earlier in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians 1, 19 through 23, Paul says it like this. He says, starting in verse 19, and what, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It is in raising Christ from the dead that Christ now sits above all as the Lord of all. It is as the Lord of all that all those who believe in him are joined to his body, which means that what's true of Christ is true of us. When you put your faith in Jesus, you become united with him. You become connected to him. Friends, for those of you who have not put your faith in Jesus, this is not true of you. But for us who put our faith in Christ, his death becomes our death. His resurrection becomes our resurrection. His ascension becomes our ascension so that in his death, we too died to sin. In his resurrection, we have newness of life. In his enthronement, we reign with him. Again, Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, Paul says that very same idea like this. He says, in starting in verse 4 of chapter 2, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Do you see what Paul says there? He says that for those who put their faith in Jesus, we are made alive together with Christ. God raised us up with him. He seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. So friend, if you're not a Christian, you will either receive eternal punishment for your sins on your own, or you will look to Jesus who paid for you, paid for it on the cross. Jesus stands willing and ready for you. Who, what will you pick, friends? Will you choose death or will you choose life? If you are a believer, you are in Christ. If you are a believer, you are part of his body and rule as part of his kingdom. Jesus is king. He rules and he reigns. And it is through the church, his body, that his rule and reign is made visible. The problem, church, is that we oftentimes think that we get to live lives on our own. We get to live our life. We think that we are free to pursue our own interests and our own goals. But Christians, Christ died and now you live for Christ. You are part of his body. You are called to live for his glory. You are called into a community to show the world what his body looks like and to accomplish his works. The question then is how do we do this? How as his body are we to strive to accomplish his works? And this leads me to my second point. Point number two, Jesus gifts the church with those who proclaim the word. Jesus gifts the church with those who proclaim the word. Look with me at verse 11. Ephesians 4, 11, Paul says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. From his place of enthronement, King Jesus gave gifts to his people. 
Know first that Paul lists several offices as gifts. It is the offices, it is the people in those offices that are the gifts that Jesus gives. So in the one way, one way in which Jesus has gifted his church is through the people who fill those offices. And it can be tempting for us to derail at this point and get into the nitty gritty of whether the office of apostle exists or not still, and whether prophecy is ongoing. But I think that would detract us from the main point that Paul is making. Paul is saying that Jesus's inbreaking rule in the world is made visible through the people who are united to him and his body doing his work in his body, doing his work. He has gifted it with those whose job is to help the church do his work. Particularly, Jesus has gifted us with those who proclaim the word, with those who proclaim the word. The apostles led and preached the word. The prophets spoke from God. The evangelists spread the gospel far and wide. Shepherds and teachers are called to preach and teach and guard the word. These different Offices have different functions to be sure, but they all are proclamation offices. Those listed here are those who proclaim the word of God. What that means then is that Jesus has gifted the church with leaders who are responsible for shaping the church through the ministry of the word. It means that preaching and teaching of the word is extremely important to the functioning of the body of Jesus. The preaching and teaching of the word at Echo Church is extremely important to the functioning of Echo Church. Paul gives one reason in two different ways on how it is the case that the proclamation ministers are important to the functioning of the church. In verse 12, Paul gives a positive purpose for the gift. And in verse 14, he gives a negative one. Let's start with the negative one. Verse 14, Paul says it, this way, so that we may no longer be children. So God, Jesus gives us the gifts of apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. The figure of blasts of storm winds and wept along is especially poignant for Paul. He was shipwrecked many times, something that is terrifying, even for the most seasoned of sailors. Paul certainly understood what it felt like to have no control and be swept along by tempestuous rollers in a small boat. Paul uses his imagery to make his point. Just as even sailors, seasoned sailors, should be afraid of being caught in a storm on a tiny boat, Christians should be afraid of false teaching. The reason God has given us leaders who are to proclaim the word is specifically so that we would not be caught out in the storm. We would not be small and weak and frail caught in the raging sea. The word used for children in the ESV is better understood or better translated as infant or toddlers. The idea that Paul conveys is of someone tiny and helpless. My two-year-old will often play in our living room, and sometimes she'll be on her back on the carpet, and sometimes she has a hard time getting up from her back because she's two. She's a toddler. False doctrine taught through human cunning and crafted in deceit will throw a doctrinally immature church like my two-year-old who has trouble getting to her feet on my carpet in my safe house, throw her around like a raging storm would. These leaders are given by Christ so that instead of being weak, the church can be equipped to stand firm in whatever for, against whatever came their way because of the strong teaching of the word of God. There's a tendency in the evangelical church to think theology is unimportant. Many think that it is just one of those heady things that is unnecessary and overly complicated. A lot of people think it doesn't apply directly to me. It causes divisions. It's cold and it's distant. Paul makes a connection here between doctrine and how we live. See, he, he says that church leaders are given to build the church up to fight against false, doc, false doctrine. The context of the passage is about tr the church building itself up to live in a way worthy of Jesus. Verse 1 of chapter 4 starts out, 
I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. What we know and what we believe about God and his word affects the way we walk out what God has called us to. And Paul takes false teaching seriously. False teachings can shipwreck our faith if we are not built up to combat it. So to fight such a danger, Jesus has given the church those who proclaim the word to those, those who bring the true message of God to shape the minds of believers. Having a deep and robust understanding of true theology provides us safeguards against false teachings that seek to destroy our faith. To know what is false, we need to know what is true. To be able to tell false doctrine, we need to know true doctrine. Just like a banker stares at a true note, a true true $100 bill, to know what a fake $100 bill is. Church leaders, pastors, and teachers are given to the church to equip the saints to identify and disregard false doctrine. That means that true doctrine is to be taught and the church is learning and absorbing it. It is the standard by which false doctrines are examined and discarded. Paul says to Titus regarding qualifications for elders in Titus 1.9, he says he, the elder candidate, must hold firm to the trustworthy a word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. One of the because they do not understand proper theology. I think more importantly, they have not submitted to the word. Jesus has gifted church leaders with the proclamation ministry of the word. It is the word that we are to learn that we are to submit to. It is the word that tells us what is true about God humanity, and the world. It is the word in which we need to submit as we understand proper doctrine so that we stay grounded in the faith. The point I'm belaboring here is that doctrine, theology, is not some abstract thing that is unnecessary and heady. Doctrine is important because it protects us from the storm of falsehood. It helps us to identify false ideologies and combat it. It helps us to stay in the faith. It affects how we live our lives as Christians and as the church. And that means that not only are pastors and elders to teach sound doctrine, but the church, all of us, are to know it and to desire it. I think part of the reasons that many Christians have turned away from studying theology is that these leaders have not done a good job in communicating doctrine in the way that God calls them to. We see in verse 15, for example, that Paul writes, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into him who is head. Notice the effect that these Christian leaders proclaiming the word and teaching right doctrine has on the church, that the church would speak the truth in love. That means that the church grows up by lovingly speaking the truth. I think that we have seen, all seen church leaders who instead of lovingly proclaim the truth, bash others who differ than them theologically. We've seen strife and division all in the name of sound doctrine and proper theology. I know of church splits. My last church literally had three church splits because of infighting over theology. I've seen friendships ended over theological differences that can seem minute and unimportant. There's no grace, no humility, no love. Here, the means the church grows is truth spoken in love. Rather than arrogance, division, haughtiness, impatience, and anger, we witness that, that any, many of us witness by those who seek to proclaim true doctrine. Paul presents leaders who equip the saints with truth lovingly delivered and applied. Instead of being a noisy gong, these leaders equip the church with nutrients that it needs to grow strong. It is one way, it is in that way, truth lovingly spoken, that the church grows into mature manhood. It is through that that they are able to obtain the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We are to grow up in knowledge and unity. Instead of being tossed around, Jesus has given leaders who expound the word so that we can grow in unity and maturity. Notice, though, that the job of these officers is not to do all the work. The positive purpose for which Jesus has given us the church leaders is in verse 12, and it is to equip the saints for the work 
of ministry. The means that uh, th that means that while church leaders are given and are crucial, they are not the only ones to do ministry. And this leads me to my final point, which is this: all Christians are called into ministry work. All Christians are called into ministry work. There's a saying that I've heard used in ministry context, and it goes something like this. In most churches, 10% of the people do 90% of the work. That's probably a pretty accurate statement of a lot of churches out there, but that only points to the mismatch of the body to the head. Paul tells us that we're all to do the work of ministry. We're all to build up the body of Christ. Imagine how our bodies would function if only 10% of it did 90% of the work. We wouldn't survive very long. How do we expect churches to survive when that's the case? Instead, Paul calls us to be a church where 100% of the people do 100% of the work to the glory of God. Oftentimes, we can think of full-time pastors as in ministry, right? When they get hired at a church, they're going into ministry. But it's not true that paid staff members are the only people in ministry while everyone else is not. These verses tell us that the saints are equipped for the work of ministry. If you are a Christian, you, my brother or sister, are called into ministry. We cannot sit back and wait for things to happen we could not come to church. We should not come to church expecting just to be served. Instead, as our Lord has said, we should come to serve. We live in a world that is inundated in a consumer mentality. Right? Many Christians come on Sundays expecting to be lifted up with good songs and to have their emotional and spiritual needs met. I want to hear songs that speak to me, which Neiman is generally hymns, just so you know. To sit down and be able to listen to a good sermon, it better have some good humor and it needs to engage me. There needs to be applications that directly apply to me. And then afterwards, I want people to meet my emotional and relational needs. Church is basically about me if I'm not careful. One author recognizes this point when he writes this. The evangelical church has become weak, flabby, and too dependent on artificial means that can only simulate real, real spiritual power. Churches are too little like training centers to shape up the saints. The average Christian resides in the comfort zone of I pay the pastor to preach, administrate, and counsel. I am the consumer. He is the retailer. I have the needs. He meets them. That's what I pay for. Another author writes this. Some people say you can't expect laymen to raise families, work all day, and shepherd a local church. But that is simply not true. Many people raise families, work, and give substantial hours of time to community service, clubs, athletic activities, and or religious institutions. The cults have built up large lay movements that are becoming a weak, are becoming a lazy, soft, pay-for-it-to-be-done group of Christians. It is positively amazing how much people can accomplish when they are motivated to work for something that they love. It's, I've seen people build and remodel houses in their spare time. The real problem then lies not in men's limited time and energy, but in false ideas about work, Christian living, life's priorities, and especially Christian ministry. Church, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the commission that he has given us is not a sit back and let others get it done commission. It is a commission to do instead of just consume. Just as Jesus reigns in the heavens and we are joined to him as part of his body, we are to be his hands and feet accomplishing his work in the world. The church is not a place to make people feel comfortable. It is a place or a people called to work together to do the work of Jesus. Look with me at the end of verse 13. Paul says that the church is called to a mature manhood. Verse 15 says that we are to grow up in every way into Christ. These verses are calling the entire church to strive towards something strive towards a goal. Sometimes I can think of becoming more like Jesus as a me thing. It is about my own sanctification, which is true. 
We are all called to be more like Jesus. And yet in these verses, Paul is actually calling the entire body as one unit to become more like Jesus. In some way, we corporately as a church become more like Jesus. Part of every member ministry is to ensure that as a whole, we are being built up into the image of Jesus together. Look at verse 16 with me. Verse 16 says this, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow up so that it builds itself up in love. First thing I want us to notice is from whom. The whom there is a reference back to Jesus. It is Jesus whom we are joined to. It is Jesus who we, whom we are united to so that it is what is true of Jesus can be true for us, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. It is only by abiding in Jesus and knowing him that the church successfully grows. It is organically from the head that the body grows. Second, it is... Uh, is that Paul states that the body, the church, can only build itself up with the proper working of each individual part. Each individual Christian must be properly functioning, otherwise the body is not going to grow. Each member of the body is called to fulfill their God-given purpose in the church, otherwise we will not grow as a church. Notice something else. Paul states that when each part is working properly, it builds itself up. It builds itself up. When each member of the body is functioning as he or she should, they build other members of that body up. When I, as a member of this body, function properly as a member, I am building others up who are members of the same body. Alternatively, if I, as a member of this body, do not function as I should be, I am not building others up. I am not doing what God has called me to as a part of this body. We have our host, and Jason did this earlier, we have our host either mention or allude to Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, almost every single week. The call is for members to consider how to stir one another up in love and good works by gathering. Church, we are to gather, to rub up against each other, to be in each other's lives, to exercise our gifts for each other, because that is what causes growth corporately. That is what causes us to mature into Jesus. I'll end this point with one final observation. Just as leaders are to proclaim the word uh, in love, the truth in love, so members are to build up other members in love. Paul calls for us as members of one another to care for one another. He's calling us to have intimacy that is uncomfortable. He's calling us to love one another in ways that be, go beyond natural reasoning. The person you're sitting next to or the person in the row in front of you or behind you, the per person sitting on the other side of this very room are interconnected with you. They're interconnected and interdependent because they are members with you. Paul isn't just talking about Christians that we like. He isn't just talking about your best friend at church. He isn't just talking about people that you like to hang out with or go vacation on with. He's also talking about Christians you don't know very well. Christians that maybe you don't, you can't stand. He's talking about the person that might grate at you. He's talking about those that you might not click with. Paul's emphasis up to this point in the book of Ephesians has been on the unity that's been brought, bought by Jesus dying for us. The death that was that has brought together people that are otherwise unlikely to associate with each other. And specifically, the example that Paul has in mind is of one body out of two very different and opposing ones, Gentiles and Jews. See, in Ephesians 2, Paul expounds on this point. He says this starting in verse 14 of chapter 2, for he Jesus himself is our peace, who has made us both, that is Jews and Gentiles, one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Remember that Jews were the chosen people of God. God had called them out to be a holy priesthood and a light to the nations. They were sons of Abraham, the people who were chosen to inherit the world. They were the ones given the law of Moses. They were given the sign of circumcision. They were the ones to bring forth the Messiah. And the Gentiles are idolaters. They were the nations, the scum of the earth, the unclean. 
And Paul says God has broken down that barrier so that now Gentile and Jews are intricate, interconnected members of one another. You are to be together and love each other. And so the question I have for you this morning, Echo Church member, is are there people in this body that you don't get along with? Are there people that are just different than you? Are there people you like more than others? God tells us that both groups are members of you and you are a member of them. You must cherish those in the body that you don't get along with. God called Jews to embrace Gentiles as intimate members of one another. We are called to do the same. Later in Ephesians, in reflecting on the relationship of husband and wife, Paul continues this metaphor of body when he says in Ephesians 5, 29 through 30, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Can you hate another member of your body? You are called to nourish and treasure each other. So brothers and sisters, treasure the members of this body. Each individual Christian who professes Christ is a part of you and you a part of them. And Christ is paid with his blood for them. We are called brothers and sisters to love one another. Our passage this morning calls us to operate as our king's hands and feet, as his body, by growing and maturing. It calls us to function in a way that builds one another up. It calls us to exercise our gifts to its full extent so that we can help each other grow and mature. If you are not exercising the gifts God has given you in the church, you are not functioning in the way God has called you to function. Each person is an individual part. Each person has a specific identity and each member must work to fulfill his or her own function to help others function. The Bible often speaks about our individual spiritual gifting. Romans 12, 6 through 8, for example, says this, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them if prophecy in the proportion of our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. We all serve an important function in the body of Christ. Whether it is the person who teaches or the person who shows mercy, we all are called to serve. Peter says the same in 1 Peter 4.10. He says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good servants of God's varied grace, whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Sometimes we can think that we must have a special gifting or some extraordinary gifting in order to use it. A lot of us can be tempted to sit and think, what's my spiritual gift? I don't know what it is. Maybe I have to take an inventory or something. You may be sitting here today wondering, what spiritual gift do I have? I'll simply say this, don't wait. Go and serve. Care for the body in the many ways that God has already gifted you. Serve in our setup, serve in our kids' ministry, serve in our tech team. There are a manifold of ways so that not only 10% has to do 90% of the work. Just because you don't perceive some extraordinary gift does not mean you are not gifted. You are gifted because you are called into his body. Serve the body in the many ways you have been gifted. King Jesus rules and reigns far above the heavens. He is the one who has ascended, who has indeed, in his ascension, brought us life. It is only in him that we find our source of life. It is only in him that we are able to grow, to be like him. It is in King Jesus that we have confidence of our future resurrection and our eternal life. He rules and reigns, and we are called to spread his message to the ends of the earth. We are called to reflect him so that others see him, hear his gospel, and join with him. He's gifted the church with leaders to proclaim the word, to build up Christians who will work out their manifold and diverse gifting in love, which in turn causes us all to grow into maturity. 
We are called to present, however imperfectly, a body that matches the head, King Jesus. Let's strive to glorify Jesus by growing in maturity together. Let's pray. God, we pray that as we go forth today, that you will help us to continue to consider ways to stir one another up in love and good works. I pray that you help us to continue to think about our brothers and sisters, those that we naturally get along with and those that we naturally do not, so that together we can continue to strive to grow as a corporate body, to match you, our head, the exalted king who rules far above the heavens as Lord and master and God of the universe. We pray these things.